welcome back. It was so refreshing to learn from John. What a powerful message, reminding us, teaching us to be mindful that we are both men and women designed in the image of God. Learning about Bible reception and the lullaby effect. The idea that we can hear something so often, we don't think about it anymore. Mm. And we don't dig into the Bible for the truth. John's message moved me to tears. As each point was made, I felt more and more valued. What an empowering, unifying message for the entire body of Christ to hear. That's right, Shyla. The message of Imago Dei is an important truth to ground us and unify us, just as certainly as the truth that we are all in equal need at the foot of the cross. Thanks so much again, John, for that incredible message. Now let's give our attention to our brother, Steve Kennard, who's going to be teaching the second of four classes today. This class is entitled The Assembly, and it's going to focus on men and women in worship together. Steve Kennard has been heavily involved in the study of Bible and gender, both internationally and in our local New York and New Jersey family of churches. Of course, Dr. Kennard doesn't need much of an introduction here, but I do want to mention that he has served as an evangelist and teacher in the New York City Church of Christ for over 37 years. He is a preacher and an academic with a Master's of Divinity with Languages from Fried Hardeman College and a Doctor of Ministry from Drew University. He's written over 15 books, and his latest book is his own translation of the Greek New Testament into English entitled The King Jesus Translation. Let me say that again. His latest book is his own translation of the Greek New Testament into English. Wow. As Steve walks us through four important texts on men and women in the assembly, I want us to feel assured that we're being led by a thoughtful and excellent guide. When I attended ministry training in the London church, I was taught that a text taken out of context is a pretext. Steve will engulf these texts mm -hmm. with context to guide us to a better and fuller understanding of God's Word. Yeah, and although this is the longest of the four classes today, it is not nearly enough time to grasp all that we need to learn on this very important topic. So let's freshen up a glass of water, grab a healthy snack as we dig in. But before that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this extra time and focus on the topic of men and women in the assembly. I pray that you will grant us all soft hearts like Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, a leader, and a teacher among the Jews, but with humility understood that the words of Jesus, your words, were the only answer to the most important questions in life. I pray also that any who have lingering questions or concerns after today would continue to study, pray, and talk to brothers and sisters. Indeed, that each of us would make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, who knocks down every barrier and dividing wall. It is in His holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for attending our workshop, Women and Men Together for God's Glory. Dr. Steve Kennard is among the presenters, was very involved in planning today's workshop as well, and is one of the authors of the book, The Bible and Gender, which is the basis of this study. Since recording today's messages, Steve has faced the death of his son, Daniel. We express our deepest sympathy to Steve and Lee and also to Daniel's sister, Chelsea Novak, and brother-in-law, Rob Novak. They all continue to be in our prayers. Also, if you have a question about something presented today, please do not reach out to Steve at this time, but instead direct any questions to your ministry leaders. Thanks again for joining us. Welcome back everyone. In this part of our workshop, we are going to, we're going to enter what is called by many the Mount Everest of the passages that talk about women and men in the Bible. 
These are the passages that are the most debated and most widely discussed. In fact, there are pages and pages that have been written on these passages of Scripture. In fact, entire books have been written just on these passages of Scripture. And so what I'm going to attempt to do over the next 40 minutes or so is to present what many people believe that Paul is teaching on these passages. Our goal for today is not to leave with a complete and final understanding of these scriptures. There's too much there. But to continue to grow in our knowledge of God and His plan for the world through them. So we will be discussing Galatians 3, 25-29, 1 Corinthians 11, 1-16, 1 Corinthians 14, 33-40, and 1 Timothy 2, verses 8-15. through Yes, that's a lot. We'll also be visiting ancient Galatia, Corinth, and Ephesus. Three of these four passages deal with the assembly of the church for worship. The one that doesn't is Galatians 3, 25 through 29. So let's begin there. Let's begin in Galatia, which is today in modern Turkey, a place that I've been able to visit. Paul writes in Galatians 3, But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now, this is a very important passage. It's a passage of liberation. It's a passage of freedom. But liberation from what? This is where the context of the whole letter of Paul to the ministry in Galatia is very important and very helpful. In Galatians, Paul was battling the Judaizers. These were Jewish Christians who expected Gentile Christians to obey the Hebrew law. They expected them to do that in order to be Christian. They expected Gentiles to obey Sabbath laws and dietary laws, according to the Jews. They believed that to be a good Christian, you also had to be a good Jew. If these Judaizers had decided to live this lifestyle for themselves, that wouldn't be a problem. But they were expecting everyone to live this lifestyle. So Paul wrote about this. And Paul counters the argument of the Judaizers by saying that we are all children of God through faith, not through the law, but through faith. The law is our disciplinarian. It means instructor or teacher or guide. The law guided us to faith in Christ Jesus. And in verse 27, Paul emphasizes that we clothe ourselves with Christ. We clothe ourselves with Christ not by obeying the law, but by being baptized into Christ. The result of that baptism is that in Christ, and here comes this amazing statement of liberty, there is no longer a Jew nor Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. This is a glorious sentence. In verse 29, he states that anyone who belongs to Christ is the offspring of Abraham, an heir according to his promise. Christianity is not about keeping the Hebrew law, but it is about being a community in Jesus. We need to be careful not to go beyond what Paul is stating. Paul is stating that anyone and everyone can become a disciple of Jesus through faith in Christ. One's ethnicity, one's social standing, one's gender, it does not matter when it comes to becoming a Christian or being clothed in Christ. No one needs to become a Jew first and keep the laws of the Jews in order to become a Christian. That's what Paul is saying. However, Paul does not suggest that Christians have no ethnicity and no social standing and no sexual identity. Again, he is saying that salvation is open to anyone and everyone regardless of ethnicity, social standing, or gender. This is very much like what we learned in the first workshop about the Imagio Dei, the image of, of God, which is in all of us. 
Genesis teaches that we are all valued in God's sight because we are all created in God's image. Paul is saying that we are all valued in God's sight and we can become disciples of Jesus through faith without keeping Torah law. Paul is speaking about our spiritual identity in Jesus. If we try to take the scripture and use it as a model or pattern for other areas of life that it doesn't mean to, to address, then we might make the mistake of attempting to mold the world by understanding, by our understanding, but not by God's wisdom. Once we are in God's grace, we are transformed so that our various attributes are repurposed toward the same goal. We all together seek to bring the glory to God. Like this workshop, women and men together for the glory of God. This results in an incredible unity in the church. We truly become one in Christ. In Galatians 3, Paul is not talking about ecclesiastical leadership. He's not talking about marriage, ministry, or the assembly for worship in the church. However, he does talk about those matters in other letters. He speaks of the assembly in his letters to the church in Corinth and to Timothy in Ephesus. So let's turn there. First, let's travel to ancient Corinth. I've been able also to visit the ruins of ancient Corinth and view its aqueduct and view the high mound upon which ancient Greeks worshiped their gods. Corinth was a city of commerce and trade. It was also a city of licentiousness and immorality. Paul arrived in Corinth from Athens, where his ministry did not flourish, but in Corinth his ministry did flourish. He stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. That's the second longest stop on his missionary tour. He wrote four letters to the church in Corinth. We have two of these letters in the New Testament. When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he was attempting to correct several issues that had come up in the church. One issue concerned what was going on in the assembly of the church when they came to worship. We find this in 1 Corinthians 11 and in 1 Corinthians 14. So let's begin by reading 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 16. You can read with me. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the husband is the head of his wife, and God is the head of Christ. Any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head disgraces his head. But any woman who prays or prophesied with her head unveiled disgraces her head. It is one and the same thing as having her head shaved. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. And if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to be shaved, she should wear a veil. For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since he is the image and reflection of God. But woman is the reflection of man. Indeed, man was not made from, from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. For just as a woman came from man, so man comes through woman, but all things come from God. Judge for yourself. Is it better for a woman to pray to God with her head unveiled? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is degrading to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is for her glory, for her hair is given to her as a covering. But if anyone is disposed to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Now, there are several points to discuss here. First, verse 3, where Paul writes, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the husband is the head of, of his wife, and God is the head of Christ. Some scholars react to this verse because of the words, The husband is the head of his wife. They find the wording troublesome because it seems to imply that the husband has authority over his wife, thus diminishing the wife. They attempt to soften the language by saying the word for head, kefele, means source, as in the source of a river. However, in the opinion of other scholars, there isn't enough use of the word kefele as source 
in Greek literature to merit that definition here. I believe that is true. But instead of getting lost in the language debate, let's turn our focus into what Paul is saying here. The key in this passage is to pay attention to Paul's wording. What is his argument? He begins with Christ being the head of every man. He ends by saying that God is the head of Christ. In between these two images, Paul places the phrase, the husband is the head of the wife. The emphasis is not on the wife. The emphasis is on the husband being like Jesus and like God in his relationship with his wife. This doesn't diminish the wife. Instead, it challenges the husband to be like Jesus and like God in his behavior. When husbands understand that Christ is their head, when they, they will not diminish their wives in any manner. Instead, they will love and nurture and care for their wives as Christ does for the church. Paul mentions that God is the head of Christ. God and Jesus are unified. They're eternally one. So ought the wife and husband be unified and one. The wording of headship ought not to be used in a manner that diminishes or values um, that diminishes the value or the agency of the wife. Instead, the language ought to challenge husbands to be Christ-like and godly in their marriages. The husband being the head of the wife doesn't mean that he is better than his wife. But as head of the wife, God expects the husband to, em to embody headship in a Christ-like way. This was very countercultural in the first century, and let's be honest, it is very countercultural today. Next comes the image of the head covering in verses 4 and 5. Paul writes, Any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head disgraces his head, but any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. It is one and the same thing as having her head shaved. Head coverings in that day and time in Corinth were a sign of propriety, respect, and decorum in ancient Corinth, just as they are today in many parts of the world. In our culture in New York and New Jersey, we might think about what we consider reverent or respectful or irreverent and disrespectful. This changes from culture to culture and from generation to generation. For example, when we attend funerals, we usually dress in nice attire. We don't usually come in sweats and running gear. Why? Because we want to be respectful to the family. When I travel to teach in Africa or Haiti, I am expected to wear a suit and tie when I preach on Sundays. I'd rather not because it's usually very warm there and the venues usually don't have air conditioning. But I respect the wishes of the culture. It is more important that I honor the people and the culture um, than dishonoring it because of my own comfort. So I preach in a suit and tie. And as I preach, the suit usually changes colors because of my perspiration, but that's okay. I do it as a matter of respect to the culture. In Corinth, the head covering was considered important. In the Bible and Gender book we read, and I quote, Paul equates an uncovered head by women in Corinth as an extreme behavior equivalent to shaving their head. A shaved female head in the ancient world was used to shame the woman. Adulteresses were denoted in front of the rest of their community by shaving their head. Paul seemed to want to challenge the behavior of some women in Corinth for uncovering their heads while praying and prophesying. End quote. There were dress code enforcers in the city of Corinth. They supervised the behavior of women in the city. The teacher papers write, quote, Therefore, it seems reasonable to conclude that Paul is correcting an impropriety of the traditional dress in, Co in Corinth. Dressing or speaking improperly draws attention in any setting that has customary norms. The dress and conduct of some people in the Corinthian church needed to be addressed to maintain the unity of the church, end quote. There's a cultural item in this passage and a transcultural principle. The cultural item is the head covering. The transcultural principle is to be reverent in worship. And how we are reverent in worship changes 
from culture to culture. It's different in Haiti than it is in New York and New Jersey. It's different in Lagos than it is in Rockland County, New York. What I don't want us to miss here, and I'm afraid we do often miss it because we're so busy trying to figure out if women need to cover their heads in worship or not, is that Paul specifically mentions that women are praying and prophesying in the assembly. You might ask Steve, in the early church, were there women who were prophets? And the answer is yes. In Acts 2.17, Peter quotes from Joel saying, your daughters will prophesy. Also in Acts, we see the four daughters of Philip had the gift of prophecy. Anna in Luke 2 is mentioned as a prophet. And the Hebrew Bible, Huldah, was mentioned as a prophet. Let's not forget that important detail. Women were praying and prophesying in the assembly. Now, to be fair, some scholars say that women were praying or prophesying in front of other women, not in a mixed audience. However, we can't say that for certain. The text doesn't make that specific statement. In 1 Corinthians 14, just a few chapters away, the audience is definitely a mixed audience of women and men. But you can see why these passages are difficult. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35. Paul, still speaking of the assembly of the church, states, Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission. As the law says, if they want to inquire about anything, they should ask their husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Now, what does this mean? Well, it can't mean total silence, because Paul has already mentioned that women were praying and prophesying. So what is Paul talking about here? Is he contradicting himself? I don't think so. Something must have been occurring that was causing a disruption of the service. It seems the disruption was occurring with some of the wives because the text mentions that they had husbands. It seems that they were asking questions during the service and disrupting the service. Now I can understand how asking a question during a service would be a disruption. If I were preaching and someone on the second row raised their hand to ask a question, that would throw me off my game. Worse yet, if somebody just stood up and said, excuse me, preacher, but why do you use so many Greek words? Well, again, that would throw me off my game. I'd have to recover from that. So Paul, in order to keep this disruption from happening, says to those who are disrupting the service, be quiet. He instructs them, if you have a question, save the question to discuss at home, outside of this assembly. We learn from 1 Corinthians 11 and 14 that there is a certain decorum that is expected in the worship assembly. It is based on the culture of the people who attend the service. But we also learn, and this is important, women were praying and prophesying in service. Paul isn't expecting women to be totally silent. He is expecting both men and women to be respectful in the assembly. One more item, the material in 1 Corinthians, is a letter and has to be read as an occasional letter for a specific group within the first century context. We ought not say, since this was, is what was occurring in Corinth, it must occur in the exact way today. That's patternism. And patternism is not a really good hermeneutical principle. However, we have to look at what was occurring in the letter and translate that to our culture today. If we were reading the same letter in Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan, we would probably be more cautious about asking women about praying or prophesying in the assembly with men and women. Why? Because that woman might be killed for her action. Also because the church might be persecuted for that action. That's true in many parts of Africa as well. Part of understanding and applying the meaning of scripture to our lives is to see what the author was saying to the original readers and then apply that meaning to the current cultural audience. This is perhaps the most difficult dilemma that Bible students face. Again, this is not easy material. It takes study and it takes discernment. So let's see how these principles apply to our next passage. Let's move to Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the great cities of the ancient world. It, was located in what is today modern Turkey. 
I visited the ruins of Ephesus. I viewed the ancient baptistries there. And I had opportunity to walk the streets of Ephesus. Paul loved the church in Ephesus. He stayed there three years, which as far as we know, is longer than any other place where he stayed on his missionary journeys. The church in Ephesus was strong. It was growing. It was vibrant. Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus to oversee and encourage the church there. And in 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now again, this is not an easy passage to understand. One could argue that this passage is not culturally conditioned because Paul reinforces his statements with references from the creation. However, when you look three verses above this, we do see that it is culturally conditioned. Paul writes, Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, men lifting holy hands, and women not wearing elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearl, and expensive clothes, all of that is culturally conditioned. Culture has something to say in this passage. So what is happening in verses 11 through 15? As in Corinth, it seems that some of the women were being disruptive in service. They were presuming to have authority over the service. The teacher's paper states this, and I quote, Recently, biblical scholars have posited the theory that Paul's writing in 1 Timothy 2 reflects the emergence of the new Roman woman in the eastern part of the empire. Philip H. Towner defines and describes characteristics of this woman, writing, She exercised freedoms and opportunities for participation in public life, political and legal activity, patron and benefactor roles that far exceeded the traditional Greek woman, who has long been the model drawn on by New Testament scholars. Moreover, the ancient evaluation of her patterns of dress and behavior locate her within something of an ancient sexual revolution." End quote. The paper continues, quote, The rulers of Rome were not happy with these changes that they saw occurring around the city. Winter writes, Augustus and some of his successors used appearance and apparel to promote values to counter what they regarded as promiscuous tendencies in the empire. The introduction of permissive clothing and hairstyles explains why Paul specifically wrote against braided hair, gold ornaments, pearl, or expensive clothing." End quote. All of those are cultural items. This was the style of the new Roman woman. In that culture, this style lacked modesty and modesty was to be a characteristic of Christian women. Thus, Paul directs Timothy to instruct the women in the church to dress modestly. This outward adorning of the body reflects the inner adorning of the heart. A big question is what did Paul mean by exercise authority? The term exercise authority is extremely difficult to translate because the Greek word authenteo is found only one time in the New Testament. That means you don't have other places to compare it in the New Testament. So some scholars say that this term carries with it a negative, even a hostile connotation, like do not usurp authority, do not seize control. Thus women can have authority over men in an ecclesiastical setting as long as they don't seize control. But there are other scholars who view this term in a more general sense as simply do not have authority. If the word is viewed in this way, then women are not allowed to have authority over men in any ecclesiastical setting. Scholarship is extremely divided over this issue, and there seems to be no way to reconcile the two camps. So we need to look at other passages for help here. The same dynamic that we see in Ephesus 
existed also in Corinth. Now we've looked at that. We know that in Corinth, women prayed and prophesied in the assembly. Therefore, when Paul instructs women to be quiet, he's not talking about absolute silence. Women were allowed to participate in corporate worship. Perhaps Paul was prohibiting the taking over or the control of the worship of the church. In Paul's letter to Timothy, it seems that Paul did not permit women to teach in the setting of corporate worship. However, this did not mean that women could not teach in other settings. Women could be teachers. As older women, they were instructed to teach younger women as well as children. And in a team effort, Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollos. However, Paul directed Timothy that women were not to teach men or to exercise authority in the ecclesiastical context. What type of teaching is Paul talking about here? Well, it must be something other than praying because women were praying and prophesying in the church in Corinth. Teaching here seems to be more of an authorized or ecclesiastical type of teaching within the church. Throughout the letter, teaching is paired with command and teach and urge and teach. That's in 1 Timothy. Also, the letter is filled with matters of doctrine and um, doctrinal concerns. Paul was not saying that women could not participate in worship, but he was instructing women not to take over the worship service. He was dealing with a problem in Ephesus. Now, we go to the question that must be asked for us today. What instructions were specific to culture and which parts of these instructions transcend culture? It seems that women in Timothy's ministry were not permitted to hold ecclesiastical authority. Is that an instruction for us today? Could this be culturally conditioned? Just as we view the prohibition of jewelry as a cultural phenomenon, understanding the circumstances of Paul's particular audience, can we likewise recognize the prohibition of women holding places of ecclesiastical authority as a cultural phenomenon? Or do we understand this as a command for all time and across cultures? We believe, based on our best attempt to understand Scripture, there, that there is at least a part of a timeless principle here that women should not hold ecclesiastical authority. And we will discuss this issue more in part four of the workshop. Clearly, Paul's intention was not to exclude women from using their gifts and abilities in the context of a corporate church meeting. However, the universal principles that we can apply have to do with decorum and demeanor. No woman, or man for that matter, should take it upon herself or himself to usurp authority or have a domineering manner. And it seems that in the setting that Paul is addressing, some women were guilty of this act. 21st century readers of the scripture can learn from these passages and can apply them to our present day context. Both men and women can use their God-given gifts of leadership, encouragement, prophecy, teaching, and serving in the ministry. However, both men and women have to be respectful. We've looked at four passages where Paul speaks to the issue of gender. Galatians mention, mentions that both women and men can become disciples of Jesus through faith without following the law of Moses. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul teaches that the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church. This challenges the husband to love his wife, as Christ loved the church. We will look at more on this particular topic in part three of this workshop. Three of the four scriptures, 1 Corinthians 11 and 14 and 1 Timothy 2, speak to matters of gender and, wor and the worship assembly. From these passages, we have learned that God wants women and men to use their gifts for His glory and the edification of the church. We've learned that decorum and respect are important to God. We see women praying and prophesying in the assembly. When Paul admonishes the women to be quiet, he's not saying they cannot use their gifts. Instead, he's instructing the church to be respectful and worshipful in the assembly. And this is where the teachers, the ICOC teachers paper landed on this topic. This is where a vast majority of our ICOC churches in North America have landed. It's difficult to be dogmatic on this topic. I personally continue to evolve in my thinking as I continue to study out this topic. But as far as a community theology goes, this is where our community is at at this point. 
This position is a viable position biblically. We still need to talk about marriage and ecclesiastical leadership. That'll come in part three and part four. What does Paul have to say on these topics? This will be our next studies. We also need to talk about changes in our assembly based on our study of these passages. Some of our elders will speak to these changes in our fourth session of the workshop. Thanks so much for your attentiveness, and I pray that God will bless our study of his word. Being valued is something I believe every human being wants to feel, to feel important, to feel significant, worthy of notice and useful. But feeling secondary can be an all too familiar feeling as well. I can't help but think about Hagar, who was Abram and Sarai's Egyptian maidservant. You know, she was involuntarily wed to Abram to provide an heir for this barren couple. And even though she was a wife, she still felt secondary, lesser, unimportant. And even after being mistreated, she runs away, yet God intervenes. In Genesis 16, verse 13, it says, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. After her interaction with the angel of the Lord, she went from feeling secondary to seen. She was seen by the God who saw her, who valued her and intervened in her misery. Being seen by God not only made Hagar feel valued, but that was a value to her. And being seen by God is what makes me feel valued as well. I've recently experienced value through my own study of the scriptures. Um, in 2020, I experienced personally misery just through heartbreak, but also the state of our country at that time during the pandemic. Um, and this was a time where I honestly didn't still feel seen or or valued both inside and outside of the church. I felt unimportant, I felt unseen, I felt scared and alone. And for me, similar to Hagar, it was through pain and heartbreak that I truly began to see my value, funny enough. You know, I study the scriptures daily only to be reminded that despite what I perceived in this country or even in my own life, that God cares about me, like it says in Isaiah 49, verse 13 through 16, you know, that he considers me, like it says in Lamentations 3, verses 32 through 33. He gives me worth, respect, and honor, even if I feel like others don't, and that I don't have to be in a position of leadership or regard to feel useful or to feel seen. Through my experience of pain and misery is where I truly experience feeling valued straight from the word of God. I've also experienced value my service within the kingdom as well, uh, specifically in my role as a minister in our edge ministry. And to be honest, I've had to battle with feeling uh, like I couldn't do ministry either alone, um, you know, without a male co-leader or just feeling like I was the person that God needed to fulfill that role that I had, did I have enough of the talent or the skills or the knowledge to really be a servant leader in God's church? Yet God constantly shows me and reminds me, and even now, how my experience, not only in the ministry, but just within my life personally, my investment in my relationship with God, and even just the unique position that I am in my life as a single Black woman, that how much God needs that <laughs> uh, in His church. You know, also within the church, he surrounded me with so much encouragement and support that I needed to just be uh, a minister in the ministry of Jesus as a single woman. And I'm so grateful for that. So I want to end with something for my single sisters. Uh, and I just want to remind you that God sees you. You are invaluable to him, an instrument for special purposes, a crown to him. You know, don't look to leadership, the world, your boss on social media, or even a man to validate you. You are valuable. And it has to start with God. Even what it says in Psalm 139 verse 13, God is the one who saw you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. That's when you and I were seen. Before any person ever laid eyes on you, you were seen by the eyes of God. You are important to God enough for him to create you as you are. 
in his image. And he didn't create you to be insignificant, weak, and useless. That's not God's image at all. We reflect the likeness of God. And when we're clear on that and how needed that we are in the relationship that God wants to have with us in his incredible plan with all that you have to offer, and yes, you do have a lot to offer, then and only then will you be truly secure in your value, no matter what happens around you, what people say, what you feel, or even what the church does or doesn't do. We love you, we value you, and most importantly, you are valued by God.